Come on in, folks. And uh, thank you for being with us today. All right. All right. We're, uh, Christine, good to see you. All right. We're in Joshua chapter 11. And uh, if you're able, out of respect for the reading of God's word, let's go ahead and stand. And we'll read uh, verse 1 uh, down through verse 6. And then we'll get started in the message today. All right. And it came to pass, uh, verse 1, we're going to start in verse 1 and read down through verse 6. I'll read out loud if you'll read along silently with me. And it came to pass when Jabin, king of Hazor, had heard those things that had sent, uh, that he sent to Jobab, uh, king of Madon, and to the king of Shimron, and to the king of Aksaf, um, and to uh, the kings that were on the north of the mountains, and of the plains south of Kinneroth, and in the valley and in the borders of Dor on the west, and to the Canaanites on the east and on the west, and to the Amorite and the Hittite, and the Perizzite and the Jebusite on, in the mountains, and to the Hivite uh, under Hermon, and to the land of Mizpah. And they went out, and, they, um, and all their hosts with them, much people, even as the sand that is upon the seashore in multitude, with horses and chariots of very many, and when all these kings were met together, they came and pitched together at the waters of Merom to fight against Israel. And the Lord said unto Joshua, Be not afraid because of them, for tomorrow about this time will I deliver them up all slain before Israel, and thou shalt hoe their horses and burn their chariots with fire. <clears throat> we'll stop right there. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Please speak to our hearts through it, and may you be glorified as we consider your word this morning that you preserve for us all these years. <clears throat> and I know you have <clears throat> these principles and these truths that you want to speak to us about this morning. Please give us your understanding, your insight, um, your discernment as you spoke through Joshua to the children of Israel uh, to encounter this great host of um, enemies uh, that were your enemies, Israel's enemies, and yet you put together uh, yet another great battle uh, to defeat these enemies and uh, taught uh, the children of Israel that by faith they could trust you and um, and uh, and uh, rally them uh, to uh, defeat their enemies and give them the strength, the courage, and the grace to overcome. And we thank you. Uh, for all of this, teach us what you want us to know. And if there be anybody here today that yet has come to a saving knowledge of Christ, maybe uh, today would be the day uh, that they come to know you personally and be assured of heaven. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. And be seated, if you would, please. <clears throat> All right, as we start out here, let's remind ourselves a little bit of what we went through. It's been a couple weeks since we've been in Joshua because of um, Easter Sunday, Resurrection Sunday coming the last week. Um, as the children of Israel came across the Jordan River and they confronted their enemies or confronted by their enemies um, in uh, a couple of different cases there, they confronted their enemies at Jericho, defeated Jericho. And after a little trouble, they defeated Ai. Those were singular enemies one city at a time or one nation at a time. Um, but then they came to a confederacy or an alliance of five different kingdoms uh, or city nations uh, that were to the south. It seems like the nation God led the nation of Israel to the center of uh, Canaan, um, uh, uh, sometimes we know it as Palestine. And they divided them north and south. And uh, that was, uh, I think, very strategic on the part of God through Joshua. Um, and they went right into the center of the nation uh, and to the land and divided north from the south. And they went towards the south and five nations uh, ganged up on Israel all at once. And that might have been a little bit overwhelming uh, to the nation of Israel because they had not come against five enemies all at once. Have you ever had one of those days where you think, you know, you got one thing against you, but then five or six things happen all at once, and it seems like the sky is falling in, and you go, good night. 
uh, what next? You know, uh, what's going to happen next? Car breaks down. Um, you know, uh, one of the kids throw the ball at the window and it breaks, and then the plumbing is leaking, and then the light doesn't work, and and something else goes wrong, and and you're going to have to take the dog or the cat to the vet, and you get this huge bill, and and then uh, the kids, uh, uh, you know, um, going to cut themselves, and now a trip to the ER with stitches and whatever, you know, and you go, jeez, you know, good night, you know, what's going to happen next? Well, then they got five enemies coming at them. But as you remember, uh, the way that God worked out to defeat those enemies and encouraging Israel at the very first part there, he miraculously caused their enemies to be defeated. If you, if you remember, <coughs> he caused great hailstones to come out of heaven. And he told in scripture there, uh, back in the previous chapter, in chapter 10, there were more defeated through the hailstones coming out of heaven miraculously, these fiery hailstones, great big hailstones falling on Israel's enemy, more defeated with the hailstones than there were by the sword. So then who gets the glory for that? Well, God gets the glory for that. And then not only that, there was another great miracle that happened. They were battling through the day there, and the sun was starting to go down. So God laid it on the heart of, of Joshua to pray that the sun would stand still. And sure enough, it did miraculously. Never a day like that before it, never a day like that after it, in all the history of the human race. The sun stood still, still for the better part of a day. Amazing, a miracle, a miracle. So two miracles on behalf that God uh, made happen on behalf of the nation of Israel so they could defeat those five enemies that day. And, and sure enough, those enemies uh, turned tail and, and ran and um, with their tail tucked between their legs and they defeated all five enemies, all five kings. And, and uh, it was an amazing victory, a miraculous victory for the nation of Israel. And they never forgot that, how that God divinely intervened for them. So then they get to this, and then they go back to the camp at Gilgal. And they're going to rest. I mean, it's not easy. And uh, they defeated those five kings, and they're just going to heal up a little bit and get a little rest. And then all of a sudden, you have this Jabin, king of Hazor, <coughs> that heard about those things, verse 1 of chapter 11. So he heard about all that. And he goes, well... So they came across the Jordan River miraculously. They defeat Jericho, they defeat Ai, and now they fight five kings all at once and defeat all those. And God worked on their behalf miraculously by bringing the hailstones out of heaven and making the sun stand still for the better part of the day. So then Jabin says, we're not giving up. We're not going to make peace with Israel. We are determined, doggedly determined, that we're going to wipe this nation out. We're not giving up our land. We're not giving up our uh, anything, our treasures, anything. So then he sends the word out to not just five kings, but many kings. And the Bible tells us that he sent uh, to Jobab, king of Madon, verse 1, to Shimron, uh, king of Aksaph, and to the kings that were on the north of the mountains, verse 2, and on the plains, so he gets mountain kings, plains kings, of these different nations and in the borders of Dor on the west to the Canaanites on the east and to the Amorite and the Hittite and the Perizzite and the Jebusite up in the mountains and the Hivite under Hermon and to Mizpah to the east also. I mean, he rounds up everybody he can find to the point where verse 4 tells us that there were so many <coughs> of a great, <coughs> excuse me, host of people that were enemies of the nation of Israel, that they were like sand upon the seashore in multitude. Israel had never faced such a strong enemy and such a multitude of great hosts before. They'd never seen such an enemy that were gathered up against them in such hosts. And not only that, these weren't just footmen coming against them. These weren't just the infantry coming against them. It says there in verse 4 that they came with horses and chariots, very many. Now Josephus, the uh, Jewish historian that happened, uh, that was there just before um, uh, Jesus came and after the time Jesus came, he, he uh, 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 wrote the history of this and had um, 
uh, secular writings available to him that we don't have today, he said that there were about 300,000 footmen, infantrymen that came against the nation of Israel. Thank you, honey. I appreciate that. For those of you visiting today, honey is my wife. <laughs> All, right. All right. Okay. Um, anyway, uh, Josephus says these great hosts, this great many that were like the sand on the seashore, were about 300,000 uh, infantrymen or footmen, about 10,000 on horseback, horsemen, cavalry, you might call them. And then about 20,000 chariots, men with horses, obviously, to pull the chariots, and uh, drivers for the chariots with their swords and spears and what have you. And uh, who knows, sometimes those chariots had extra riders in them with bows and arrows, uh, to, and, you know, they could throw spears and wield swords as well. Um, and uh, we don't know about that. But that was just a lot to take in for the nation of Israel. It was a lot. And when all these kings met together, now they were the aggressors. There's the one, they were the ones that took the initiative. Understand that Israel's back at their camp at Gilgal, resting up, healing up, uh, kind of catching their breath, so to speak. And Jabin, who was the ringleader of all these, he's from Hazor, he gets all these others together and says, we're going to attack when they're back at their camp and resting up. We're going to catch them by surprise. Well, someone has once said, did it ever occur to you that nothing ever occurred to God? Did it ever occur to you that nothing ever occurs to God? Meaning God's never caught by surprise. So Jabin and all his great host of Canaanites, Gentiles that were coming up against Israel, they might have thought that they were going to catch Israel by surprise, but they're, you never catch God by surprise. So he knows everything. He's omniscient. He sees everything. And so you're not going to catch him by surprise. So all these kings were met together, verse 5, and they came and pitched together at the waters of Merom to fight against Israel. They're the aggressors. They're going to catch Israel off guard at Gilgal. So they think. Verse 6. So the Lord comes to Joshua because he knows all this. And he says to Joshua, now, I don't know if you have a red letter edition Bible, most red letter edition Bibles are red letter only in the New Testament. And the red letters are when Jesus speaks in the New Testament. Some red letter edition Bibles are red letter also in the Old Testament. If you have a red letter edition Bible <coughs> that is red letter in the Old Testament as well, excuse me, then verse 6 would be in red with the exception of that first line where it says, and the Lord said unto Joshua. That wouldn't that'd be in black. But the rest of verse 6 would be in red because it's the Lord speaking to Joshua, saying, Be not afraid because of them. For tomorrow about this time will I deliver them up all slain before Israel. And thou shalt hoe their horses and burn their chariots with fire. So God knows what all these enemies of Israel is doing. Joshua doesn't. The nation of Israel doesn't, but God does. And he comes to them, comes to Joshua, the leader, and says, hey, here's what's going on. All these guys are ganging up on you. But don't be afraid. You've never faced such a host like this before. You've never faced such danger like this before. You've never faced... Um, 20,000 chariots before. You've never faced any chariots before. You don't know how to do battle with chariots. You've never faced 10,000 horsemen before. All you've faced before is infantry. People coming to you on foot. But don't be afraid.
because tomorrow, about this time, I, I will deliver them into your hands. You're going to go to battle, but I'm going to deliver them into your hands. So here's the deal. Even though you're going to go to battle and you're going to fight and you're going to put a great effort into this, but I'm the one that's going to give you the victory. Because over and over and over again, ladies and gentlemen, in the Bible, God says, don't put your faith in your own strength. Don't put your faith in the strength of the horses. Put your faith in me, in God. So when you go to battle, understand the battle is the Lord's. Amen. Amen. And um, we read that over and over and over again. You don't fight the devil in your own strength. And, and, and he's the enemy. The world's the enemy. Your own flesh is the enemy. But you can't fight your enemies in your own strength. Every single day when you go out to face the day, understand that be strong in the Lord and the power of His might and put on the whole armor of God. And so that you'll be able to stand against the wiles of the devil and, and uh, uh, be able to face the enemies uh, that, you, that you know, the natural enemies that you have, that you can't do it in your own, can't do it in your own wisdom, can't do it in your own strength. You've got you've, uh, you to use God's wisdom. You've got to use God's strength you know, to fight. The, it's not that you don't have to put some effort in. You know, you still have to get up, put your clothes on, put your shoes on, Go out and face the day. You have to get into the Word of God. And uh, you have to spend some time in prayer. Some time in the presence of God. You have to be filled with the Spirit of God. And yield your life. You have to put the effort in to be dead to self. And alive to God. You know. You have to yield your life. To the Lord Jesus Christ every day. You have to be obedient to the Lord. Versus being disobedient. You have to be dead to self. The Bible says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, so that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So, yeah, there's things that we must do ourselves and yielding to the will of God for your life and not fighting the will of God for your life. And so there's things that are our part to do. But understand the battle is the Lord's. And He gives us strength for the battle every day. Psalm 18 verse 39 says. But here it is. New dangers need new strength every day. New enemies need new plans, new strategies and new comforts. They hadn't faced this enemy before. They hadn't faced this many enemies before. They hadn't faced this type of um, uh, attacks before with those chariots and with the horses and everything. And hadn't been this down this road before. So needs some new strategies, needs some new strength, needs some new comfort, needs some um, new direction from the Lord, needs some new promises from God and this is God's word verse 6 is God speaking so this is like God's word because it is God's word so we need to hear from the Lord fresh and anew every day amen we need to hear from the Lord every day because we don't know when you you know get up in the morning you don't know what you're going to face that day I don't know what I'm going to face any given day so that's why we need to get into God's word isn't it amazing how many times you get into God's word in the morning and he gives you something and lo and behold, later in the day, you face what you read in the Bible that morning. Yes. Isn't that amazing? You didn't know, but God knew, didn't he? God knew. You didn't know. I didn't know. But God knew. So God tells, before the battle comes on, God tells Joshua, hey, don't be afraid. Because of them. For tomorrow, Joshua hadn't faced tomorrow, but God knows what's going to happen tomorrow. Isn't that Wonderful that we've got a God that knows what's going to happen tomorrow. Yeah. And He knows what's going to happen later on today and tomorrow and the next day and the next day. He says, tomorrow about this time, I'm going to deliver them up to you, all slain before Israel. And thou shalt hold their horses and burn their chariots with fire. That's a lot. 300,000 infantrymen, 10,000 horsemen, 20,000 chariots, and however many drivers plus 
maybe somebody stands beside him, that could tell. So amazing. Never faced that many before. Mm -hmm. How many of you remember the story over in 2 Kings chapter 6 when Elisha and Elijah, or not Elisha, Elijah, but just Elisha and his servant, um, uh, what had happened was this, um, the Syrians had wanted to attack the northern kingdom of Israel. And Elisha, being a prophet, had information from God directly. And he kept telling the king of uh, Israel, hey, um, don't go over here because the Syrians are going to come over there and they're waiting for you. So the king of, of Israel wouldn't go there. And sure enough, they escaped the attack from the Syrians. And then the next time, the Syrians would be waiting for Israel over here and Elisha would get a word from God. So he'd say to the king of Israel, hey, don't go over there because the, the uh, Syrians are waiting for you over there. And um, sure enough, the king of Israel would send scouts over there. And sure enough, they were waiting in ambush over there. And so pretty soon, the king of, king of Syria said to his men, all right, which one of you is a spy? And telling the uh, king of Israel where we're waiting to ambush them. And they said, king, nobody is a spy. God's telling uh, the prophet Elisha, um, just whatever you say in your bedchamber, God's listening to it and telling Elisha, and Elisha is telling the king of Israel, oh really? Well, let's take out Elisha. So they said, where's Elisha? And, well, he's down in Dothan. He's down in that city, Dothan. And so he took massive amounts of troops, and they totally surrounded the city of Dothan. And they were waiting for Elisha to come out uh, one morning, and his servant came out. And he ran back into the house and he said, Elisha, we're surrounded. We're done for. Our goose is cooked, so to speak. You have to read the line between the lines and see about that goose being cooked thing in the Bible. But anyway, he said, we're surrounded. We're done for. And he says, no, we're not. No, we're not. He says, what do you mean? He says, let's step outside and I'll show you. He said, I don't want to go out there. He says, we're, he says, Syria's got our whole uh, city surrounded. Look on the mountainsides. Look on uh, right down here. And we're surrounded by the king of Assyria and his armies. He says, step out here outside the front door and I want to show you something. And Elisha asked the Lord to show his servant all the great hosts of heaven that were waiting there to defeat the armies of Syria. And God opened the eyes of that servant and all the host of heaven, all the angelic hosts were completely 360 degrees around the city that were much more, the Bible says in 2 Kings 6 and verse 16, much more than the armies of Syria. Um, and a great host of heaven with angelic hosts and armies and fiery chariots. And they defeated um, the armies of Syria. And they were much more. So what I'm trying to say is, is this. It doesn't matter how many the enemy raises up against you. God is much more than your enemy. And God always has much more than your enemy. So don't be intimidated by the enemy, whether it's the world, the flesh, or the devil. God is much more than your enemy. And he has a great angelic host up there that you and I can't see right now. But he's much more than your enemy. Amen? Amen. Much more than your enemy. And you may not see them, but they're there. And they're there to defeat the enemies of God and the enemies of God's people and your enemies. So we go on. Verse 7. So Joshua came and all the people of war with him against them by the waters of Merom suddenly and they fell upon them. Ah. So the enemies of Israel were going to come suddenly upon Israel at Gilgal, but God turned the tables on them and said, no, we're going to come suddenly on them. We're going to uh, make a surprise attack on them, just like they did on those other five kings in chapter 10. We're going to have a surprise attack on them, and that's what they did. They caught them unawares, verse 8 and following. <clears throat> and just like the Lord said, and the Lord delivered them unto the hand of Israel and who smote them and chased them unto the great Zidon, unto Mizrib uh, of Foth, Mayim, 
and unto the valley of Mizpah eastward, and they smote them until they left them, none remaining. And Joshua did unto them as the Lord bade them. He hoed their horses and burnt their chariots with fire. And, um, and Joshua at that time turned back and took Hazor and smote the king thereof with the sword, for Hazor before time was the head of all those kingdoms. And again, as I said before, <coughs> in Psalm 18 and verse 39, God says he gives you strength for the battle. They were there resting in Gilgal, trying to rest up from the battle that they'd had before with those other five kings. But uh, God gave them strength for the battle that they needed against this great host and these armies that came against them like none had ever before. Those kings were more than they'd ever had. But then what did he do here? He gave them instruction. When you beat them, and when you, when you defeat them, don't keep their horses. Don't keep their chariots. You hoe their horses. In other words, you hamstring them. You cut those uh, uh, tendons and ligaments of their hamstrings to where they won't be used in battle anymore. They'll barely be able to use to maybe pull carts and burn their chariots, use them for firewood. Why? Well, for a couple of reasons. One, that the children of Israel will be confident then that those will never be used against them again. That those nations will not be able to regroup other nations that are out there because they don't know. They don't know if there's any other city nations or kingdoms that will somehow get those horses and get those chariots and use them against them again. So they burn the chariots and they hamstring the horses and they know those won't be able to be used against them again. But secondly, so the nation of Israel won't use them. We'll say that kind of, I don't know, wouldn't it be advantageous for them to use those horses and use those chariots in future battles? Well, now, wait a minute. Did they need them to defeat their enemies this time? No. Psalm 20. I'd like you to hold your place here and go over to Psalm 20. Psalm 20. We won't take long in Psalm 20. But it's just a few verses I'd like you to see. In Psalm 20. Start in verse 1. With me, if you would, please. Psalm 20 and verse 1. The Lord hear thee in the day of trouble. In the name of God of Jacob defend thee. The name of the God of Jacob defend thee. Send thee help from the sanctuary and strengthen thee out of Zion. Remember all thy offerings and accept thy burnt sacrifice. Selah, grant thee according to thine own heart and fulfill all thy counsel. We will rejoice in thy salvation. And the name of the God of our God will we set up our banners, and the Lord fulfill all thy petitions. Now I know that the Lord saveth his anointed. He will hear from his holy heaven with the saving strength of his right hand. Some trust in chariots and some in horses, but we will remember the name of the Lord our God. They are brought down and fallen, but we are risen and stand upright. Save, Lord, let the king hear us when we call. Some will trust in chariots and some in horses, but we will remember the name of the Lord our God. So God told him, hold those horses, cut their hamstrings so that they can't be used in battle again. Burn the chariots. You trust in me. I'll win your battles. And so they burnt the chariots and they hamstrung the horses so that the children of Israel would not depend on the tools and the instruments of the heathen, of the pagans, but they would trust in God to fight their battles. Not that they didn't have a part in the battle. They still wielded the sword. And remember this time, they didn't get any hailstones out of heaven. They didn't get any sun standing still. Initially, God used that to encourage them against the first five kings when they got ganged up on by a confederacy and a great alliance of 
five nations coming against them at once and God knew what they needed at the time with some extra encouragement but now that they had defeated five kings and they had this massive host of armies coming against them at once God said I'm not doing that this time but I'm still going to deliver you you're going to have to use your sword this time but it's still going to be me that gives you the strength Sometimes when we fight the battles that we go along each day, sometimes God will give you a miracle. Sometimes He'll give you two or three miracles. And you go, whoa. There is no other explanation. That was God that did that. And He gets right in the midst of your business and shows you His hand and it was God all the way. And you go, that was God. Other times, He says, I'm still going to deliver you but there's not going to be any miracles. I'm just going to get down in the trenches with you. And we're going to fight this out. And we're going to do this. And it's still going to get done. And we're still going to win. There's not going to be any miracles. It's going to be a hard-fought battle. But we're going to still come out on top in the end. And we're still going to come out with a big V, a big victory. And uh, it's going to be all to the glory of God. And uh, God did it with a greater host and being perhaps outnumbered in skill-wise and things like that with the chariots and the foot of the horses and skilled and battle and things like that. Um, but um, still, God got the victory and God got the glory. And they won. They won the battle. And moving on... Um, Moving on with this, um, Hazor thought that he was going to um, maybe escape, uh, not Hazor, uh, Jabin, the king of Hazor, and got back into his town of Hazor. Thought maybe he was safe and protected there, but he wasn't. It was kind of like a trap for him. He just got back into his hometown and it was told Joshua, so they just went to Hazor, trapped him there. He ended up losing his life there and his whole town was burnt down burnt to the ground and as we read continuing on in verse um, let me see if there is something there no. verse 11 and they smote all the souls of that, that were therein with the edge of the sword utterly destroying them and there was not <clears throat> any left to breathe and he burnt Hazor with fire and verse 12 and all the cities of those kings and all the kings of them did Joshua take and smote them with the edge of the sword and they utterly destroyed them as Moses servant the Lord had commanded but, verse 13, as for the cities that stood still in their strength in Israel, burned none of them save Hazor only, that did Joshua burn. <coughs> Which is kind of repeating the last couple of verses um, as far as what happened to Jabin and, and Hazor, but not the rest of the cities. Because God, through Moses, had told them way back in Deuteronomy 6 and verse 10, when you go into the Canaan and into this promised land that I've um, uh, foretold that you would have you're going to dwell in great cities that you didn't build and so sure enough God through Joshua at this point said okay you're going to burn Jabin and his city to the ground and no, nobody's going to be left to tell the story about that one from that city and everything but you're going to spare the other cities and you're going to live in those cities just like God had told Moses before. And so they didn't have to labor. They didn't have to build those cities up from the ground. They just got to go in and inhabit the cities. So the fruit and the labor of the sinners is laid up for the just, as God says in the Word of God. And, and God did that, and He rewarded them in that way. Verse 14 and following. And all the spoil of those cities... And the cattle and the children of Israel took for a prey unto themselves. But every man that they smote, they smote with the edge of the sword until they had destroyed them, neither left they any to breathe. And as they commanded Moses, his servant, so did Moses command Joshua, and so did Joshua. And he left nothing undone in all of all that the Lord commanded Moses. And Josh, so Joshua took all the, that land and the hills and the south country and all the land of Goshen and the valley and the plain and the mountain of Israel. And, and the valley of the same, even from the Mount of Halak, and uh, 
goeth, that goeth up to Seir, even unto Baal Gad in the valley of Lebanon under Mount Hermon. And all the kings he took and smote them and slew them. So Joshua made war a long time with all those kings. It was so, supposedly that um, this uh, campaign of Israel coming into the land took about five to seven years for them to go through in Joshua's time <coughs> with him being the commander in chief and um, the general that led uh, the nation of Israel into battle uh, to um, possess uh, the land that God gave them and took about five to seven years and verse 19 and following and there was not a city that made peace with the children of Israel save the Hivites, the inhabitants of Gibeon, and all the other they took in battle. For it was of the Lord to harden their hearts that they should come against Israel in battle, that he might destroy them utterly, and that they might have no favor, that is, no mercy, that they might, that uh, he might destroy them as the Lord commanded Moses. Let's pause right there for a minute. It says in verse 20, that it was of the Lord to harden their hearts. Understand this. Jabin, he's the one that saw what happened to these other nations. And he's the one that came up with a plan to gather these other nations together. Massive amounts. So many as the sand of the seashore that they would come against Israel all at once. He was the mastermind behind all that. He saw that Gibeah made peace with him, but everybody else fell out of rebellion. Understand this, we've said this before, but let's remind ourselves. When Abraham came into that land 420, 430 years before that, Abraham preached the truth and made it known to the Amorites, all the other people of that land, that this was a land that God was going to give his people. And they had a choice at that time. Remember the Creator. Remember all the way back to Adam and Eve that God created this whole world. He spoke it into existence when there was not one human being here. Not one. The one true and living God, Jehovah God, the great I Am, the only God. There are no other gods. And he told them and taught them the right way of worship, Adam and Eve. And they passed that on to their children. Verse 2, Cain and Abel. Cain chose to rebel. Abel did not. Abel um, conformed to God's way of worship. He understood the truth. Cain understood the truth also. But he said, I'm going to do it my own way. And Cain brought things of his own hands to worship the Lord and Abel brought an acceptable sacrifice of worship to the Lord God accepted Abel's sacrifice Cain did not I mean God did not accept Cain's sacrifice and Cain was ticked off but God said that's okay Cain you got another chance just bring me the sacrifice that I told you and that you very well know is the right way to worship me. Worship me the right way and all is good. And Cain said, no. I'm going to do it my way. God said, have it your way. And Cain was cursed. Cain started an ungodly line of people who refused to worship God his way. Cain went out and killed his brother out of jealousy because God would not accept Cain's act of worship and sacrifice. From that, all the way down through time, there came a people, a line of people, Cain's posterity, that wouldn't worship God his way, acceptable to God all the way through generations and generations and generations of people. And they began to scatter out and even have variations of Cain's worship. But it was all to do with works. 
all to do with me, 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 me. My own way, not God's way. And so, when Abraham came along in the land of Canaan, it was an opportunity for the Canaanites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, all of them that we just spoke about here and others, to get it right. And they had 400 and some years to get it right before Joshua and the children of Israel came back to Canaan. They had that opportunity to get it right. But by the time he got there, they were still killing their babies, offering them for sacrifice to Moloch, putting them in the foundations of their uh, cities as sacrifices to their false gods. They were still refusing to worship God in an acceptable way. They didn't believe Abraham. They wouldn't get it right. They had four, over another over 400 years after being warned, this is what's going to happen. God's going to come and take over this land. You have all these years to make your choice again. And they didn't. So Joshua came back and all these people were destroyed. And there's a lot of naysayers out there who say, well, why didn't he destroy them? They had 400 years to make the right choice. And they didn't. They said, no. Like Cain said, no. We're going to do it our way. My way. I don't care what God says. Um, no. So Joshua comes in and he does. So here's, the, here's what I'm trying to say. Verse 20 says, For it was of the Lord to harden their hearts. But they hardened their own hearts first. And then God says, okay, then I'm going to harden your heart to where it's not possible for you to get saved, for you to have repentance. Because you hardened your own heart first. That's what Jabin did. He hardened his own heart first. And then God hardened his heart. The same thing with Pharaoh down in Egypt. He hardened his own heart first. That's what the scripture says in Exodus. Then God hardened his heart afterwards so when it says God hardened their hearts it's after they hardened their own heart first is what I'm trying to say verse 21 and at that time came Joshua and cut off here's the last part of it okay here's some of the last enemies that under Joshua's rule that were defeated verse 21 and at the time and at that time came Joshua and cut off the Anakims from the mountains and from Hebron, and from Debir, and from Anab, and from the mountains of Judah, and from all the mountains of Israel. Joshua destroyed them utterly with their cities, and there was none of the Anakims left in the land of the children of Israel, only in Gaza, and in Goth, and in uh, Argath, and in Ashdod there remained Anakims. They were the giants. These were like the Goliaths. He was an Anakim. Remember, Goliath was of Gath. When it came, and David comes much later, it was Goliath of Gath, and he had four brothers. That's why David, when he went down to the stream there at Elah, he got five stones because he had because Goliath had four brothers. Mm -hmm. And so, Goliath of Gath, he was a giant. He was over nine feet tall. And so, um, remember, forty years earlier when the children of Israel, when uh, Moses sent spies into the land, sent 12 spies, they came back, 10 of them, well, all 12 of them came back and said, there's giants in the land. They were the Anakims. And we're like grasshoppers in their sight. These guys are huge. They're over nine feet tall. You know, they're taller than Shaq. And um, we're like grasshoppers in their sights. There's no way we can do this. Except for Joshua and Caleb, they said, yeah, we can do it. God can do this through us. Through us. Well, there were Anakims there, uh, tucked away up in the mountains, all these different mountains. That's where they lived, a lot of them. And so Joshua uh, led his people to hunt these guys out in the mountains. And uh, they were tucked away in the mountains. 
and they went after these guys and defeated a lot of them, except the ones in Gaza and Gath and Ashdod. Some of them remained, and we come across those in the book of Judges, and then also in David's day, obviously, um, because he's still fighting against Goliath there, um, the Philistines there. And again, they're also the Philistines. And so they really are pretty successful in fighting the Anakims. And um, I guess what I could say principle-wise about this is this towards the last of the campaign under Joshua. And uh, they start to divide up the land after this. But towards the last of our lives, towards the end of our days here on earth, sometimes when we think, I'm getting old. I'm in my golden years. Sometimes we can have some of the more difficult of our trials and tribulations towards the end of our years. When we think that those bigger trials and tribulations will be behind us. When we were perhaps raising our families. And now that our kids are grown and gone, let them have the big trials and tribulations, not us. It's not always true. Not always true. So these are giants that Joshua and the children of Israel are facing towards the last part of their defeating the enemies in the land. These are the bigger ones. These are the more difficult ones. Tucked away in the mountains. Harder to get to, harder to defeat. They're stronger, they're bigger. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 26, the last enemy to be defeated is death. But praise the Lord, hallelujah, glory to God. Jesus already defeated that enemy for us. Amen. No death. Um, where is thy victory, O grave? Where is thy sting? Sting, where is thy or death? Where is thy sting? Grave, where is thy victory? But thanks be to God, the Lord Jesus Christ. He's the one that got us that victory already. And we don't have to worry about that enemy. Because those of us who have received Christ as our personal Savior, that battle's already been won by our Savior. And uh, we now have heaven to look forward to. And we don't have to be afraid of death. We don't have to be afraid of the grave uh, because uh, Jesus has already made us uh, overcomers, champions, victors in that area. And so, again, a great big hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Glory to God for that. But if you're here today and you do not know Jesus as your personal Savior, He can be your champion too. He can give you the victory also if you're willing to Trust Him as Savior and let Him take away your sins for you and give you eternal life. Then He will deliver you from uh, that, um, that enemy uh, called death as well. And so uh, I hope you will let Him do that. He's the only one that can. Our hope is in Christ. And He's the only hope of a lost world. And uh, He remains the only hope of that lost world out there. Let's go ahead and close our eyes, bow our heads, please. No one looking around. You're here today.